Old-Fashioned Murder and Mayhem, Little Girl in Pink, Mary Daly, 1925. 17-year-old Phyllis Bauer was returning home Friday afternoon, September 4, 1925, after a morning of shopping. Miss Bauer was the daughter of Joseph A. Bauer, Vice President of New York Trust Company. Phyllis noticed two little girls in her yard struggling with a man as her chauffeur pulled onto Upper Mountain Avenue, the posh New Jersey neighborhood where the Bauer Mansion was located. She recognized the girls as Janet Dix, 11, and Mary Daly, 6, who had probably come to play with her visiting cousin, Dorothy Coates. To her utter horror, the man snatched the smaller child in the pink dress, threw her into the waiting automobile, and sped off. Phyllis leaped from the car, shouting for John Santine, her driver, to give chase, while she rushed into the house to telephone the police. Welcome to another episode of Old Fashioned Murder and Mayhem. I am your host, Mindy Hudson, bringing you tales of scandal and true crime with a twist of genealogy. Join me today as we untangle the heart-wrenching story of the little girl in pink, Mary Daly, 1925. To fully understand the saga of the 1925 kidnapping of six-year-old Mary Daly, we must first explore another kidnapping that occurred the year before, shocking the world with its senselessness. That is the case of Leopold and Loeb, who murdered 14-year-old Bobby Franks for the thrill. The murder had taken place in the ritziest neighborhood in Chicago and involved two teen boys from wealthy, privileged families. Both boys had every advantage and were of extraordinary intellect. The pair carefully planned and executed the crime, believing they were superior human beings above the laws and taboos that governed common people. Their lack of remorse or shame was the catalyst that brought the post-war era of jazz, booze, and moral decadence into question. An explosion of violent crimes committed by young people shook the nation, and indeed the modern world, to its core. It was the time of the birth of psychological studies seeking to determine whether there was more to the criminal mind than simply good and evil. Alienists, physicians, law enforcement, and criminal justice systems struggled to understand whether more was at play than traditional moral and social beliefs could explain. When Leopold and Loeb, who had committed such a heinous act, escaped the hangman's noose, the world held its collective breath to see what would happen next. David F. Daly, president of the Washington Hardware Company, married Martha Brannigan and made their home in the beautiful and exclusive Montclair, New Jersey neighborhood. There they began a comfortable life with their three children, Mary, David Jr., called Buddy, and Andrew. Little Mary was the darling of her parents' hearts. Fair-skinned, freckled, with blue eyes and blonde bobbed hair, she was like a ray of sunshine. The daily home was located at 5 Prospect Avenue. It was a spacious yet modest home. Screened porches encircled the exterior of the home, lending a cool, shady area for the adults to sit and enjoy an evening's respite while the young children played at their feet. A small sidewalk skirting the street led to the more affluent street of Upper Mountain, where the ultra-wealthy movers and shakers of politics and industry lived in sprawling mansions. This was the epitome of the American dream. It was early September, and the Montclair School was due to reopen in about two weeks. The neighborhood children were eager to squeeze the last bit of summer fun out of those waning days of freedom. Mary Daly was set to begin first grade this year, and the thought of her baby going off to school filled Mrs. Daly with pride and dread. That Friday morning, Mary, six, and Buddy, four, set off to play along the sidewalk with Janet and Nancy Dix, eleven and seven, respectively. 
The quartet was headed to the Bauer Mansion at 136 Upper Mountain Avenue, where another child, Dorothy Coates, also seven, was staying on an extended visit with her aunt and uncle. As they reached the well-manicured lawn, a Dodge automobile pulled just past them and stopped in the road. A young man exited the car and quickly headed toward the children, his eyes fixed on Mary. Caught completely by surprise, the children had no time to react. He demanded, Little girl, where do you live? However, he gave no time for Mary to answer as he whisked her over his shoulder and quickly stepped back to the running car. Astonished, all the children began screaming. Mary fought with all her might and even landed two kicks to the man's face before being shoved into the vehicle, which sped off. At the same time, Miss Phyllis Bauer, returning home from a morning shopping, witnessed the commotion as her driver, John Santine, pulled onto Upper Mountain Road. She instructed him to pursue the fleeing automobile as she stumbled into the house to sound the alarm for help. Santine was able to chase the car for some distance. He stopped briefly along the way to pick up two more men to aid in the chase. At one point, he pulled his car in front of the escaping car and managed to drive it into a ditch. He shouted for the man to stop and get out, but was answered by a bullet which grazed his head, knocking him unconscious. His companions were forced to abandon the chase and get Santee to the hospital. The kidnapper was able to get away with the helpless child. Fortunately, 11-year-old Janet Dix had the presence of mind to memorize the license plate of the fleeing automobile and gave the description to the police. They tracked the owner of the car to discover that it was a taxi rental that had been ordered earlier by a mulatto chauffeur named Raymond Pierce. An arrest warrant was executed and a manhunt for Pierce commenced. As word reached the Daly family that Mary had been kidnapped, the shockwave of grief was overwhelming. Tall, lanky, Wearing a straw summer hat and puffing away on a long pipe, David Daly quietly tried to make sense of why his family had been targeted. Although comfortable, the Daly family was by no means wealthy. Martha Daly, a pretty and vivacious mother of three, was completely prostrate with grief. It wasn't until about 4 p.m. in the afternoon that a clue to what may have been a case of mistaken identity came to light. At that time, Mrs. Emma Bauer, wife of Joseph Bauer, received a telephone call from a mysterious male with a clipped, educated-sounding voice. He asked if she was interested in a girl with a pink dress, to which she replied she was. He instructed her to, quote, deposit $4,000 into a bank in the theatrical district of Manhattan that night, end quote. Mrs. Bauer realized the kidnapper must have assumed the child was her daughter Phyllis, or perhaps her niece Dorothy Coates, who was about the same age in coloring as Mary Daly. Mrs. Bauer immediately passed the information on to the authorities. At the same time, the body of Raymond Pierce, the assumed suspect, was discovered by a passerby. He had been shot in the back of the head and his body was crammed into a culvert. Examination of the abandoned Dodge he had been driving revealed Pierce had likely been murdered by a person or persons riding behind him in the vehicle. An autopsy revealed that Raymond Pierce had been dead at least three hours prior to the time of the kidnapping. Mr. Pierce went from being a suspect in the case to a victim. He was a husband and father of four young children who were left to mourn this senseless murder. The pain and indignity of what happened to the Pierce family was shattering. It took a bit more detective work, but while the search for the missing girl continued, the search for clues to the identity of the kidnapper also ramped up. The Joseph Bauer family, 
the local Montclair newspaper, and David Daly offered a reward for information leading to the recovery of little Mary and the arrest of her kidnapper. The following description was published and distributed, quote, Mary Daly, age six, fair, freckled, blue eyes, blonde bobbed hair, wearing a pink gingham dress, pink stockings, and tan sandals, end of quote. A break came when a second abandoned vehicle was discovered near the area. The vehicle was registered to Mrs. Dix Noel, Authorities rushed to the residence. Harrison Knoll, 20, eldest son of New York attorney Dix Knoll Sr., was taken in for questioning when bloodstains were found on his coat jacket and shells matching those used to kill Pierce and wound Santine were found in his room. Harrison lived in Montclair with his mother and younger siblings. His parents had been estranged for at least a year. Harrison Webster Knoll was born in 1905 to Dix Webster Knoll Sr. and Annie F. Webster. A short time later, two more children joined the family, Dix Jr. and Mary. Knoll Sr. brought a house at 295 North Mountain Road in Montclair, Essex County, New Jersey, and practiced law. The Noel marriage hit a snag around 1924, and Dix moved out of the household and into the residence of Mrs. May Bradley of Manhattan, New York. Annie Webster Noel was an accomplished woman in her own right. At the age of 17, she attended school in Berlin to hone her skills as a writer. Upon her return to the United States, she had many of her works published in prominent magazines, such as The Atlantic. She was well-respected in the community and known as a gentle and kind lady, which contrasted sharply with the brutish reputation of her estranged husband. There had been signs throughout the years that the eldest son was quote-unquote not quite right. The Noel children were active members of the prestigious Scouts of America, Troop 4, established by Frank Fellows Gray, known as Uncle, in 1909 in Montclair, New Jersey. Gray was a personal colleague and friend of Lord Robert Baden-Powell, founder of the Scouts. Harrison formed a very intimate relationship with the enigmatic leader, which later developed into a bizarre campaign in which Harrison sought to become the commissioner's heir. When Gray fell ill, Harrison started sending letters repeatedly asking that Uncle leave his estate to him. The following are excerpts from a few of the letters published in the Montclair Times, New Jersey, September 12, 1925. Quote, Please send me $25 and have the rest of your estate put in my name, that is, legally fixed, so that it becomes mine automatically when I am 21. If there is not enough to support me, a wife, and kids, independent of my work, we must raise some more. And, you had better come away from that sanitarium. It is sinfully expensive anyway, and for all I know, to the contrary, beyond my means. I suppose there is a lease on those rooms in the Madison building. And again, If you do not wish to comply with my demands, I shall consider you unfit to be shot and will spurn you utterly. In another letter, Harrison outright requested that the commissioner should die. Quote, Please die. I wish you had some money so you could leave it to me. But if you haven't, never mind. Die anyway. You see, I am sure there is somebody somewhere in the world who wants to be preserved, protected, and defended by me. So please die. P.S. If this request meets with your approval, kindly okay and return. End of quote. Apparently, Uncle would not agree to the terms of Harrison's request. Not long afterward, the young man made a visit to the sanitarium where Gray was confined and refused to leave until the authorities threatened his mother that they would commit the young man to an institution. Mrs. Knoll brought the boy home. 
Dix Knoll Sr. had moved out of the household following an earlier incident in July 1923 in which the entire family had gone on a camping trip to Sag Harbor. Knoll Sr. later stated that he and Harrison had stayed up talking and that during the night he was awakened by blows to his head. Harrison was hitting him with a hatchet. Mr. Knoll claimed it was the first time he had ever seen his son act in a violent way, and he sought advice from a neurologist who recommended the boy be sent to an institution. It was here that Harrison was diagnosed with catatonic dementia praecox. Nevertheless, Mr. Knoll claimed it was not the dangerous type and that he could be better treated at home. Following the incident with the commissioner, Harrison was committed to Overbrook Asylum on February 23, 1925, where he stayed only a short while before he escaped. Police picked him up at 26th and 9th Streets in New York on June 29th and sent him to Belleville Hospital as an amnesia patient. Three days later, he remembered his name. The staff contacted Mrs. Knoll, who came to pick him up and took him back home. He did not return to the asylum. When word reached the Daly family that the person responsible for the kidnapping of their daughter had been detained, Mr. Daly rushed to the police station. Falling to his knees before the young man, he implored that he tell where his little girl could be found. Harrison assured those gathered that the child was safe. He then added that he had revealed the location, if given $4,000 to do so. The authorities offered to write a check for that amount, but Harrison wouldn't fall for that. He'd only accept cash. Newspaper reporters noted that the youth seemed to be enjoying the notoriety and wore a smirky grin when addressing the authorities desperate for information. The agony experienced by those gathered as time slipped away must have been beyond endurance. Harrison admitted the kidnapping, but claimed he had not killed anyone. At about 4 a.m., Harrison's mother asked the detectives to allow her to talk to her son alone. When she emerged from the room, the young man finally relented and agreed to show them where little Mary Daly's body would be found. Harrison Knoll was loaded into a police caravan with a host of law enforcement officers who drove to the Osborne Stone Quarry near Little Falls, New Jersey. As the driver approached Preakness Road, Harrison urged him to slow down. The following excerpt from New Jersey Daily News, September 7, 1925, described the scene, quote, This is the place, he remarked and leaving the automobile, walked about 50 feet into the brush, glancing about him as though momentarily at a loss. Noel suddenly pointed to a disheveled little heap of soiled pink, half hidden by weeds. There she is, he said as he stood, held by detectives. Good God, man, how could you do it, gasped a policeman. Oh, well, I killed her and that's all there is to it, was the slayer's reply. Mary Daly had been beaten about the head and then shot twice, once in the head and once in the neck. Harrison said he shot several times but missed. There was no indication she had been criminally assaulted. The Chicago Tribune, September 7, 1925, stated, quote, She was lying on her back. Her hands were crossed. Her frail, rose-hued dress was not disarranged. The small head was turned slightly to one side. The child might have been asleep. End quote. Upon hearing their daughter was found, Mrs. Daly completely collapsed. Mr. Daly calmly admitted that he expected that Mary would not be found alive and wanted to make sure that no other parent would have to experience such a heartbreaking loss. In the following days, there was an outpouring of grief and sympathy for the families who had suffered such great loss at the hands of Harrison Noel. A collection was gathered for the family of Raymond Pierce to aid in the care of his widow and orphaned children. 
On the day that Mary Daly would have started first grade, instead her little body was carried slowly through the Holy Name Cemetery in a small white coffin covered in pink and white flowers. Mary's mother wore a pink dress in honor of her daughter. When it was over, she walked unsteadily to the car, and the silk curtains were pulled down to grant a small bit of privacy. How had such a tragedy come about? How had an obviously mentally ill man been allowed to roam freely about, buy a gun, obtain an automobile, and carry out such an evil plan? It was a perfect storm of events that came together to culminate in the catastrophe of September 4, 1925. Chicago State Attorney Robert E. Crow stated in the Daily News on September 8, 1925, quote, If Nathan F. Leopold and Richard Loeb had been hanged, I believe such a crime as the kidnapping and murder of Mary Daly in Montclair, New Jersey, would have been prevented, end quote. At the time of Bobby Franks's kidnapping, Harrison Knoll had taken a liking to a 15-year-old girl by the name of Miss Bertha Heiser. Using the name of Wallace Payne, a convicted sex offender who was in the same asylum as Knoll, he hid his true identity. According to Miss Heiser, she was attacked by the man she knew as Payne, but was able to get away from him. In the meantime, Knoll purchased a gun under that pseudonym. It was the gun used in the Montclair crime spree. Following the example of Leopold and Loeb, Noel prepared to get the money he believed he deserved by kidnapping the child he had seen at the mansion on Upper Mountain Avenue and demanding a ransom. He had had the presence of mind to order a taxi to pick him up so as not to take the chance of his own vehicle being identified. Unfortunately for Raymond Pierce, he was the one who was hired to pick up the young man. Noel stashed his car in a hidden area and got into the taxi. He sat behind the driver and soon shot him in the head. Pierce fell over into the seat and Noel climbed into the driver's seat, shoving the dead man over. He drove around until he found a good place to dump the body. He dragged Pierce's body down an embankment and stuffed him into a culvert. By around noon, he cruised into the neighborhood where he spied the group of children playing. The little blonde girl looked like his target, and he stopped the car and ran over to her asking where she lived. The hysterical screaming of the children alarmed him. He snatched her up as she fought him. As he sped away, another car driven by the chauffeur of the Bower Mansion chased him through the streets. He couldn't lose him. Trying to control the hysterical child while evading the pursuing car, Harrison lost control and had to stop. He pulled out the pistol and fired at the driver. To his delight, the bullet struck the man and caused him to collapse. Harrison didn't know it, but the driver was only grazed and would live to identify him. After losing his pursuers, Harrison drove the child to the remote area of the quarry and beat her about the head, then tossed her into the brush. He shot at her, striking her twice and killing her. Harrison returned to the place near where he had hidden Pierce's body. He hoped that if found, authorities would assume the man was connected to the kidnapping and would throw off suspicion. It worked for a while. That is, until it was determined the man was dead hours before the kidnapping took place. Harrison's fatal mistake was leaving his own vehicle in a suspicious area. If he had simply driven it home, he might never have been found. The trial for Harrison W. Noel took place in November 1925 in Essex County, New Jersey. He was charged with the murder of Raymond Pierce and the kidnapping of Mary Daly. Since she was killed in Passaic County, he was not charged with her murder. Although found guilty and sentenced to life in prison, he was never sent to the penitentiary. Instead, because of his mental condition, he was sentenced to spend his life in the asylum. 
The story of the kidnapping and murder of Mary Daly did not garner the massive nationwide attention that the Leopold and Loeb crime the previous year had done, even though many of the details were so similar. Perhaps the most intriguing and puzzling aspect of the myriad cases that involved young perpetrators throughout the decade of the 1920s was that so many of those responsible for the crimes came from family backgrounds that did not fit the preconceived profile of the kind of monster who would be expected to commit such atrocities. These were young people of privilege and breeding most of them were intelligent. As a matter of fact, the majority were considered way above average in intellect. They wanted for nothing and had everything to secure a bright and promising future. Public imagination was captured as experts struggled to find some answer to explain how this phenomenon could happen. Even in the Knoll household, one son took the path of a monstrous criminal while the other became a well-respected university professor. Both sons were raised with the same advantages and handicaps. What went wrong? What part did the absence of a father in the household play, if any? Was there some nefarious connection in the relationship between Uncle Frank Gray and Harrison that tipped the scale for the lad? Was there a chemical or genetic malfunction within the family that contributed to the young man's instability? The answers to these questions may never be known. Dix Knoll Sr. and Annie Webster Knoll were divorced in 1927. She cited abandonment as the cause and noted that her husband had given no support to the family during Harrison's ordeal. Dick Sr. died in 1936. Annie went on to become a noted writer and died in 1963. Harrison Knoll spent the next 48 years in the room building at Trenton State Prison Hospital. He was transferred to a civil mental hospital in 1973 where he lived until his death in 1977 at the age of 72. David and Martha Daly went on to have three more children, two girls and a boy. A daughter, born the year after the tragedy, was named Mary in honor of her sister. Thank you for listening to the story of Little Girl in Pink, Mary Daly. See the description box below for more information on resources used to reconstruct this and other historical true crimes. If you enjoy this type of content, please like, subscribe, and leave a comment. For suggestions or questions, please contact Mindy Hudson at M-E-L-I-N-D-A-M-A-L-O-O at gmail.com. Join me again next month for another episode of Old Fashioned Murder and Mayhem.